Hi CryptoDevs, Liarco here, and in this video about the ERC721 collection project from the Ashlips lab, I'm gonna show you how to configure your collection while also paying attention to security. Let's get into it. Okay, now you should know the project structure, and we can go on with configuration. I want to start from the .env file, since here we have to make important decisions about our deployment and management strategy. This project is very flexible. You can manage it with commands from a terminal, using your private keys directly, or you can use MetaMask through Truffle dashboard. You can probably also deploy it with third-party tools like Remix, for example, but I personally do not recommend this last option. Deciding which option to choose is up to you, but depending on your choice, you might have to configure your project differently. First of all, we copy our .env.example file and rename it to .env. The reason why I created the example file is because then I was able to add the real .env file to git ignore. This means that if you are using git in order to manage your project, you can be sure that your .env file will never be committed by accident exposing your sensitive data. As you can see, the file is grayed out, so it's ignored by git. I highly recommend to never share this file with anyone, especially if you're putting your private keys in there. The variables inside the file are pretty simple. We have the URI prefix for the reveal collection. Please always remember the training slash here. We have the network URLs for the testnet and mainnet. Here you can put any RPC node you like. And we also have the private key of your wallets for testnet and mainnet. In the next video, we're gonna see exactly how to use this method here in order to manage the collection, but these four variables are only required if you want to use the CLI directly without having to confirm each transaction manually using MetaMask. Many developers use this option in order to get the fastest and cleanest user experience possible, but please make sure you know the risks associated with managing your private keys on plain text files. Remember that by owning a private key, anyone will be able to own the corresponding wallet, including all the funds in it. The next variable is the coin market cap API key. We're gonna use this in one of the next videos about how to test gas efficiency and costs. You can get a free API key directly from the coin market cap website, or you can leave it as default if you're not gonna use that feature. In order to create an API key, you can go to coinmarketcap.com slash API, sign in with your personal account, and then you'll be able to copy your free API key. The free plan should be fine for most users. Last but not least, we have the Block Explorer API key. This key must be created on the Block Explorer website of your specific network, so it might be Etherscan, Polygonscan, or any other Block Explorer which is compatible with Etherscan's validation API. You can simply sign in with your account, go to the API keys page and create a new key. Remember that usually your mainnet API key will work for the corresponding testnet too. So Etherscan's API key works for RinkB, as well as the Polygonscan API key works for Mumbai, and so on. This API key will be used in order to verify your contract of the Block Explorer automatically, just by running a simple command. Now that we know what's inside the env file, we can move on to the config folder. Here we have the collectionconfig.ts file, which contains the main collection configuration. The first two properties define which networks you want to use as your testnet and mainnet. It's important to specify the correct settings here, because these will be used by both the CLI, when using the private keys directly, and also by the minting dApp, in order to validate the current connected network. The default values are fine for Ethereum, but we recently introduced some presets for Polygon as well. You can even pass a custom network object if you want to support other networks. We will consider adding other presets depending on your feedback. Then, we have the contract name. 
This property should never be changed manually because whenever you rename it, you also have to make several other changes around the codebase. For this reason, I created a custom command that takes care of it. So we can run yarn rename-contract and specify a contract name. And everything will be changed automatically. Since I'm using Git, Visual Studio Code is also able to show me all the changes that were made to the original project. Token name and token symbol should be self-explanatory. You can choose whatever you like. Hidden metadata URI is the complete URI to the hidden metadata file. Max supply is the maximum amount of tokens that will be available in your collection. There is no rule here, but you need to choose this upfront because you won't be able to change it after deployment. Then we have the sales settings. First of all, you need to know that the contract supports two different sale types, the whitelist sale and the public sale. The pre-sale is actually just another public sale with different settings, and I decided to create dedicated settings and commands for it since it's pretty common in collections. Please remember, you always have to close any sale before opening the next one if it's of a different type, otherwise you are free to leave it open. For example, if you go from a whitelist sale to a pre-sale, the type is different, so you have to close the whitelist sale before opening the pre-sale. On the other hand, if you are going from a pre-sale to a public sale, then there is no need to close the sale between the two, since they are basically the same thing. Anyway, I always suggest closing the sale every time when possible. You are also free to skip any sale step or even run them multiple times depending on your needs. Just make sure you test the workflow before you go into production. Each sale has the same properties. The price is set using the main network currency. For example, if you are on Ethereum network, the whitelist mint price will be 0.05 ETH. On Polygon, the price will be exactly the same, but using Matic instead. The max mint amount per TX is the maximum number of tokens that a user will be able to mint per transaction. Please remember that there is no real way of preventing people from buying multiple times on a public sale, even if you are tracking wallets, balances or whatever. So, this property just sets the limit per transaction, not per person, not per wallet. The contract address must be replaced after deployment, with a string representing the actual contract address. The marketplace identifier is a value used by the DAP in order to build the URL to the collection on the marketplace. For example, on OpenSea, it's the collections log. At the moment, we are supporting OpenSea only, but you can create your custom configuration in order to support other marketplaces if you wish. The last property contains the whitelist addresses. These are taken from a dedicated JSON file which contains a simple JSON array of addresses as strings. Here are some important rules. You should always have at least two addresses in the whitelist. And whenever you update your whitelist file, you will have to rebuild and redeploy the DAP. And also, if you already opened the whitelist sale, then you have to run the whitelist open command again in order to update the Merkle tree root hash with a new one. What I'm about to say may sound stupid, but always make sure you saved all the configuration files before deploying your contract. I saw a lot of users complaining about failing contract verification, but it was due to this small mistake. If you forget to save your configuration and you deploy your contract, then all the default values will be used during deployment. If you then save the file, at that point your configuration won't match with the deployed one, and you won't be able to verify the contract. This is all you have to know about how to configure your collection project. Please think carefully about how to keep your .env file safe, and I also suggest you deciding whether to use Truffle dashboard or your private keys depending on your experience level. Remember that anyone who knows your private key will be able to control your wallet forever. 
And that's all for this video, I hope this will help you keeping your wallet safe and if you have any questions or anything you would like to see in the next videos, please let me know in the comments. Thank you for watching and bye!